Well, good evening. It's uh, good to be back again worshiping our Lord. Uh, it's good to be uh, back in Psalm uh, 19 and to uh, finish it out this evening. Uh, it's been a joy to be in this psalm, but even as I've been studying through it, I do admit uh, I started out just because I like the first six verses of this psalm. I've memorized those verses as a child, and as often when you uh, study scripture, especially uh, when you are preaching it, uh, you've erred greatly if you've not yet applied it to yourself. And, and as I went through this psalm, I've just been pulled in um, through David's prayer and his experience uh, and the way that this psalm uh, starts out so broad and joyful, but quickly narrows down to a man who has encountered a holy God, uh, and it impacts his prayer. Uh, so what's happened so far in this psalm? Well, David begins in verses 1 through 6 with this broad look at God's glory and greatness, and that this is declared by creation, and creation uh, is enjoying this good blessing of purpose, the purpose of declaring the glory of God. Well, David can only but be challenged by this and, and driven uh, deeper. He draws our attention next to God's perfect revelation, his written and revealed instruction to mankind, uh, that God is our covenant Lord, that he draws close to us as men and women in relationship to him as our king, and that he gives us perfection and wisdom and teaching and instruction and this, this perfect conversation which impacts every area of our soul, of our mind, of our heart. Our entire being is brought to uh, tremble in fear and awe as we're enraptured by the God who speaks to us in his word. Well, this brings us to our verses today, our, our challenging verses, as David, uh, much like Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6, is undone by his reflection of the Lord and his perfections. So we see in verses 12 through 14 this evening, David's response to encountering God in his word. So in brief, I want us to see that David is humbled, that he sees himself truly and that he sees his need for a redeemer. So let us uh, give our ears and our hearts um, wholly to God's inerrant word to us this evening from Psalm chapter 19, verses 12 through 14. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also, from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we ask that you would work by your Spirit, uh, now through this word read and uh, through uh, my preaching, it, that our, our hearts uh, would be transformed, uh, that our love for you would be uh, magnified, and that we would see ourselves uh, rightly through your word to us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, John Calvin and his uh, Institutes of the Christian Religion, you may be familiar with those some thousand plus pages, uh, give or take. Uh, he lays out what he sees as the most essential doctrinal um, heads that flow from Scripture. And I wouldn't blame you if you not uh, read them in their entirety. It took me being assigned them and uh, a grade being attached to my reading them to get through it cover to cover. And there was some assistance of the PDF reading it out loud to me as I, as I read it, just, just helping me just per, uh, persevere through it. Well, he starts out the very first line you might be more familiar with than anything uh, further in. He says, nearly all wisdom we possess, that is to say true and sound wisdom, 
consists in two parts, the knowledge of God and of ourselves. And unfortunately, many times this quote is a a jumping off point for a call of some sort of mindfulness and self-introspection, that uh, religion is a pursuit of uh, understanding ourselves, uh, and it leads to just happy internal reflections. Uh, Know yourself, be true to yourself. Well, anyone who keeps reading uh, past that quote, um, as it's quoted and requoted and and misunderstood often, knows that Calvin wasn't done speaking. That that's a misunderstanding of Calvin to go that direction with knowledge of God and knowledge of self. For Calvin, true knowledge of self is an exposure of errors, our sin, our folly, our uh, neediness of a Savior, to see God's greatness in comparison to um, our need. He says, the feeling of our ignorance, vanity, poverty, infirmity, and what is more, depravity and corruption. We recognize that the true light of wisdom, sound virtue, full abundance of every good, and purity of righteousness rest in the Lord alone. And we think, well, maybe Calvin was reading uh, Psalm 19 um, as he penned these thoughts. Well, this is David's experience, uh, this true knowledge of self as the scripture reveals to him uh, that he is undone. Uh, We need God's word to reveal knowledge of self. And we also need God's word to reveal Christ's grace and his mercy. Uh, But we need to see our hopelessness. Uh, The sheer goodness and sweetness of Scripture revealed to us in verses 7 uh, through 11 is revealing the perfections of God. Uh, And then David jumps from there in verse 11 specifically to say that the warnings are good, that they're a guide in a life that is pleasing to God. And David is saying, Uh, Thank you, Lord, for taking the time to warn a sheep like me from running off that cliff. Thank you for not having apathy towards me, but love. So these scriptural warnings is, is like a garden, and you go out to till the garden, and you start exposing all these rocks. Those rocks have always been there, but just below the surface. Uh, And what scripture does as a warning is just tills them up uh, and shows you that they were there. It's always been rocky ground. Uh, Nothing has changed. It's just been uh, exposed. And then by the warning, uh, David is is happy. He responds to this warning in verses 12 to 14. Uh, This warning uh, drives him to respond in prayer. So I want us to see in verses 12 through 14, that God's word produces four responses of prayer. Uh, Four responses of prayer. First, a prayer of recognition of sin. Uh, a, A second response, a prayer to be declared justified by God. Third, a prayer for God's preservation from sin. And fourth, a prayer that puts hope in God as personal redeemer. So hope in God as personal redeemer. So the perfections of scripture show us a holy God and exposes our sin. Well, how do we respond? Uh, Look with me in verse 12. The first two responses are here. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Who can discern his errors? We know uh, this type of question has an implied, no one. Who can spot their errors? No one. Uh, No one on their own discerns their errors. Uh, And there's a ignorance or a being deceived. Uh, Sin uh, deceives us. Uh, Ignorance uh, is oftentimes not as dangerous Uh, You might not know your pews in front of you. There's a little circle, and that's where you can put your communion cups. 
You might not just know this up before. It's, it's there in front of your pews. There's a little circle, and you can place your communion cups in there. Uh, it's not so bad if you never noticed that before. You might have noticed. You might not have. Uh, and then there's, though, there's being deceived. Uh, sin uh, deceives us. Uh, when we're deceived, uh, this is a situation when it's revealed to us. Uh, it can even be embarrassingly. Uh, think about if you've ever been informed from someone that you smelled. Uh, you're blindly going along, unable to self-correct, because you have gone nose blind. It's how smell operates. So until there is an intervention, until there is sometimes an unpleasant intervention, uh, there is no way for us to correct this error uh, that we have fallen into. But the good news is that Scripture allows God personally, as a Father, Jesus as our King, the Holy Spirit indwelling in us to intervene, to speak into our life. Uh, Jesus did this on earth. The gospel tells us that he knew the hearts of men, and that's why he didn't entrust himself to them. Uh, and Jesus knew the hearts of men. He didn't entrust himself to them. And who was he not entrusting himself to? Well, usually the well-respected and upstanding men. Nope, not trusting them to make me king. On the outside, Many were led astray. They could not discern that the Pharisees were just whitewashed tombs. They did not have the nose for the secret sins that the Pharisees were just as much in air, just as much under judgment as the notorious sinners. We were unable to detect their sins. So Jesus continues to speak through his word to us. Uh, applying it by his Holy Spirit to reveal to us our errors because he knows our hearts. Well, what happens if we uh, do not uh, listen to this, if we do not heed this warning? Well, if we uh, ignore this, if we take away the authority of Scripture from over us, we become our own final authority. Uh, no longer will anyone be able to speak into our life the same way Jesus does in his word. And we will go through life nose blind to the aroma of rebellion and death of our fallen world. So we will have our uh, beliefs formed by our culture. Uh, and since our only source of knowledge and truth is coming from our own culture, there is no room uh, for correction. There is no uh, intervention from God into our lives. We'll be blind to the possibility of error. David says, who can understand his heir? And we need to really see how this question is a rhetorical recognition of sin. No one can understand their heir. All do err. The scripture in this sense acts as a mirror. It reveals us. It allows us to see how we really are. And we must go to the scriptures again and again to have that correction applied to our lives. And next, David cries for a declaration of innocence from his hidden faults. He knows that he cannot have cleansing from sin and declaration of innocence from God anywhere except the gospel of redemption by God of sinners. David is very familiar that he must go to have sacrifices made on his behalf if he is to be cleansed. This is the power of Scripture, the power of God's law to warn, drawing our attention to the uncleanness of sin, to give us a sharp nose for it. So we now know of our need to ask God for cleansing, to ask him to search us and know us, to cleanse even our hidden sins from us. And we need to make this prayer our prayer. God, make my nose so sensitive to sin in my life that I am nauseated by it, that I hate my sin. God, help me to see the need for your grace outside of my own righteousness, which I now see as filthy rags in your sight. You see, David is dealing personally with himself. Uh, he deals entirely with himself in this psalm. God's glory and holiness has not caused him to look around at everyone else around him, 
but only to ask God to cleanse him. So there's a warning here. We are great at sniffing out others' sins. Uh, Growing up, I could always notice that I could tell my different friends use different types of laundry detergent. But of course, my clothes had no odor to them. (laughs) Uh, We're great at sniffing out others' sins, but we're always nose blind uh, to ourselves. And sometimes I was jealous of my friend's laundry detergent. I wanted to figure out what that was. But how comforting before you go out to know spiritually that I am squeaky clean, declared innocent in my father's eyes. In fact, in Christ, I smell good. I'm a pleasing aroma to God the Father because I have the assurances and promises of Christ's blood and the wisdom, the knowledge of what sins are still in my life. So in encountering scripture, we are made more and more aware of our errors because God speaks to us continually in them. This awareness of sin that scripture uh, reveals to David allows him to take the next step in his prayer. He says, keep me from the sins you have just revealed to me, Lord. But that is assuming we want to be preserved from sin. Look in verse 13, David's third response, a, a prayer for God's preservation from sin, from specifically presumptuous sin. He says, Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sin. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. What is presumption? A presumption is prideful, arrogant, high handed, and presumptuous sin is prideful, arrogant, high handed rebellion. Uh, the, the word has this idea of puffing up and swelling out and up against God and his commandments. Presumptuous sin does not cry out, preserve me from this. Just because our sin is revealed to us does not mean we've always taken the next step of crying out to the Lord to keep us back from it. Uh, God teaches Israel in Numbers chapter 15 Uh, It's a good chapter to read in its entirety, Numbers chapter 15. Well, what this chapter deals with is uh, what to do when someone sins against the law of Moses unintentionally, unknowingly. Well, this chapter says it is still sin. There is still need for a sacrifice, for atonement, for that sin of ignorance. But it has less severe temporal punishments to it, less severe earthly here and now ramifications. Now, clearly, what is being taught here, if we look through this chapter, we can see all sins deserve God's wrath and curse. All sins require atonement. Uh, They are all transgressions of the law of God. Uh, And David is aware of that, but he has a fear He fears the greater, the presumptuous sin. Not this Numbers chapter 15 uh, scenario uh, where someone rolls into Israel uh, and happens to transgress a a law that they, they did not understand, but was ready to receive correction from it. David has a right and godly fear stirred in him from his earlier meditations on the glory of God, the perfection of God revealed in scripture. He says, I've searched your word. I've gained wisdom from it. I see my sin more clearly. Now, what am I going to do? Lord, I am not strong enough to do anything. I need you to work in my life. I need your strength in my life because I see in myself that I can high-handedly see my sin and do it. I can still hurl myself headlong into this sin. When sin entices us, we often feel the struggle in us of whether after marking something as sin, as marking as out of bounds, as dangerous, of still pridefully lifting up our spirit against God and his ways. 
and we think we are the master. We think in that moment we are the captains of our destiny, and we have every right to take the thing we desire, to say those words, to harm, to destroy others, and get away with it. Not only to get away with it, but to prosper in it. We have presumed we can self-justify it. In reality, our prideful lifting of ourselves up against God is what brings about sins, casting us down, having dominion over us, making us slaves to sin and bondage to Satan and his kingdom. We are far too proud. We believe that all our sins are like a pet poodle, a, a lap dog for our enjoyment, but really no threat to us or anyone. No presumptuous sins are more severe than not only our transgression, but David says, great transgression. The Westminster Divines understood the scriptural teaching of David in Numbers 15. And I found in recent years in our guts, we know this to be true, but the opposite has become a truism on the lips of many believers uh, and pastors. This, this category uh, we, we know to be true, uh, but we often uh, contradict. So, but a quick look at uh, Scripture's index. Uh, in the, if you got your copy of the Westminster Confession and you go to the index of Scriptures there, you'll see Numbers 15 and you'll see uh, Psalm 19 as well. And Westminster Larger Catechism uh, 151 and 152. Well, they ask this question. Are all transgressions of the law of God equally heinous in themselves and in the sight of God? And the answer, all transgressions of the law are not equally heinous, but some sins in themselves and by reason of several aggravations are more heinous in the sight of God than others. And the next question clarifies, well, what might make this uh, more heinous to the Lord? It says, if done deliberately, willfully, presumptuously, impudently, boastingly, maliciously, frequently, obstinately, and so on. And that word presumptuously is them just lifting uh, David's uh, words here. The great preacher Charles Spurgeon says it this way, presumptuous sins are particularly dangerous. All sins are great sins, but yet some sins are greater than others. Every sin has in it the very venom of rebellion. But there are some sins which have in them a greater development of the essential mischief of rebellion, and which wear upon their faces more of the brazen pride which defies the Most High. It is wrong to suppose that because all sins will condemn us, that therefore one sin is not greater than than another. These are challenging words by David and uh, Spurgeon and uh, our, our forefathers in the faith. But praise be to God that we have this prayer of David. Who better to give us both warning and comfort? Warning of his sin. We think of David's life. Uh, what was David's life? Well, we, we think of his sin with Bathsheba, that he murdered a man to cover up his sin, to quell his conscience, to hope that he could just uh, get away with it and presume that his sin would not find him out. Think of the comfort that God can create a clean heart, that God goes to David and redeems him and cleanses him and restores him makes him useful to him again. We are never beyond the restoration and cleansing blood of Jesus. So with David, I encourage you to not simply uh, let your sin and the devil to accuse you of its sinfulness, to be, but to remember that feeling. You're discerning, as David says earlier, that this conviction, that that sin this conviction of it in itself is a great mercy. It's the grace of God. It's God creating a soft and a tender heart that feels the burden 
of sin greatly. That this heart is a heart that longs to look to Jesus as a great Savior. The scriptures tell us, he who is forgiven much loves much. Your justification, your adoption into the family of God is not in peril because you have a conscience that has been stricken with the severity of sin. It's just the opposite. David was in far more danger when his presumptuous sin with Bathsheba remained unconfessed, that he believed he had gotten away with it. It was when the the prophet Nathan stirred up a conviction of sin that David cries out for cleansing, for a transformed heart that could be offered up to ask the Lord to give him that heart. Believer in Jesus used this prayer of David's as a prayer for preservation from sin and your sanctification and a reminder of your acceptance before God when your sin convicts you that you are reconciled, that you are covered in the blood of Jesus, that you have cleansing, that you can be declared clean in Christ. And if you are here today and your hope, if your assurance, if your comfort in life and in death is not that you stand before a holy God only by the redeeming blood of Jesus, if your conscience is on the fence about the severity of your sin, I ask you, what are you going to do? Well, you could do two common responses. Uh, You can, one, you can self-justify and downplay sin in your life. Or you can look outside of yourself like David and cry out for the Lord for help as our rock and redeemer. And David points us only to the blood of Christ Well, what does self-justifying look like? Self-justifying assures us that the problem is always others, those out there. And it ultimately seeks to construct a mindset that allows every wrong we commit to be explained away. The final responsibility never really lands with us. If you are still tempted to Look to yourself and your own efforts to overcome and justify your sin. Then you are like everybody. This is a temptation for all of us. We are all so creative at justifying our sins. We are excuse-making machines. Pastors and teachers justify their knowingly teaching false doctrine because of the comfort and the praise and approval it brings them. Business owners knowingly justify abuse of employees. Employees justify stealing time or improperly done work. Family members justify treating each other more poorly than they would anyone else in their life because they have to put up with us. We in our hearts can be experts at justifying every small step of the way towards an affair. We justify how we use our money, Any sin, you name it, it can and it has been written off at some point in history and by entire cultures explained away. As you go through the centuries, any sin, look at that sin, we've done it personally, entire cultures have done away with it through self-justification. Given enough time and effort and twisting of scripture, we can with presumption declare ourselves innocent. But let's look again at David's prayer. David is intentionally listening to God and his word, and out of it cries to God for the strength to flee sin, versus simply being aware something is sinful and then starting your elaborate setup to begin justifying yourself in your own eyes. I don't know how many times I have uh, been confronted with a temptation and I'm already two or three steps into planning my justification of it uh, before I've even done it, of knowing that I'm in the right, that it's not that bad. Our hearts 
are constantly at work to ease our consciences. But David pleads, Lord, keep me from presumptuous sin. Keep me from self-justification. Keep me from declaring myself ignorant and continuing headlong into sin. We do not know when this was prayed, but God certainly has the power to convict sin. God came to David. He cleansed him. He sent him Nathan. Nathan wisely helps David to see his sin, to see the conviction of it by telling that little story of a sheep. He helps David to rouse himself against his own sin, to reawaken his conscience against it, to be strengthened to go to the Lord in repentance, to cry out for new obedience. Brothers and sisters, we are called to two actions in the face of sin. Both to confess our own sin, to ask the Lord for strength to fight it, and to do what sometimes is the harder thing, to go to one another for help with sin, to be willing to speak to others out of love about their sin with the motivation of Nathan, of restoration of skill, of using questions and tactfulness to draw us out to see again God's goodness in our own need. So what is your hope? Well, I would submit you do. Our hope is that God will convict us, that God will justify and cleanse us, and that in our sanctification, God is the one who keeps us back. God is our hope. David says, you, God, keep your servant. God alone delivers. There is hope in this prayer that God is the one who rescues. It's not up to us. So we should persist in our prayers for others. That We should uh, pray for name by them to the Lord that, that they would be delivered. But most importantly for ourselves. The word of God is sweet as honey. Moreover, by his word, we are warned. Our errors are exposed and we turn to God for his strength in putting those sins to death. And that is good. Do not shortcut conviction in your life. Don't shortcut when God calls you to action in his word. Don't just say softly, softly. Don't think, don't discern. Don't tell yourself it's just a tiny foil, foible, not presumptuous rebellion against God. No, conviction is a gift from the Lord. It is good. It's good because conviction drives us to despair, to despair and casting about in the darkness. And instead it causes us to look to the light for rescue to look for the breaking of the dawn, for the warm release from guilt, despair, and shame that only comes from the cleansing blood of Jesus, washing and healing and restoring. You can almost feel the groans and the tears of David as he gets to this point in his prayer. He's been praying for a while, and he gets to this section, and he cries out, Lord, please do not let me sin. But oh, I do. I need you, Lord. I need your strength. I need a rock to rest on. I need a redeemer. And that's how David closes his prayer. Look in verse 14. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. God has spoken to David life and comfort of his glory. Now David is asking God to change how he thinks how he speaks, how he lives. The conversation with God and reflecting on creation has revitalized David. He sees that he needs to be changed, that he needs a particular relationship from God, that he needs a new heart, that he needs a redeemer. He needs every thought, word, and deed to be realigned, to be thinking God's thoughts after him, and that this is impossible without a new heart and a redeemer for it to be acceptable. Now let me practically say here, suggest that you model your own prayers on the Psalms. That you slow down and you read lines and that you turn them back 
and rephrase them as a prayer for yourself. In Spanish class, we would often practice uh, the professor uh, saying, uh, you are hungry, and we would say, I am hungry. And we would just practice flipping verb tenses, and it was reflexive. The teacher would say something to us, and we would turn it back around into the first person. And that's really what I'm saying uh, for you to do, uh, to take David's prayer and to flip it back around as your words to the Lord. You are praying God's words back to him. And it's already in prayer form. It's already so personal. Uh, we can do this with any part of Scripture, but it's especially appropriate with the Psalms. It's hard to miss how personal David's need is for a Redeemer. His experience is so easily our experience, and so easily it becomes our prayer. We need a rock and a Redeemer just like David. Well, this says that God is a sure, safe, and certain turning place for help for repentant sinners. That he has come, that he has paid the price, that he has rescued, that Jesus living and dying and rising for us, that he is the word finally and fully revealing God. That like David, we know God not only as our creator, but as our Redeemer, Jesus as our Savior and King. Do you, like David, see your need for Jesus as your Redeemer? Do you recognize that God's Word has acted like a mirror and it has exposed your sin? It's plowed and tilled and revealed your sin. If you haven't come to encounter this yet, I would tell you that you only We'll see this through Jesus, through him proclaim to you. And we encourage you to start in some place like John's gospel to see who Jesus is more fully. If you do know Jesus as your redeemer, then through the word may effective by the spirit in your heart and your mind, Christ, your savior, dwells in you. The Holy Spirit is at work in your heart and mind to transform you to be more like Jesus every day. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we ask that through Jesus, working in us by his word and spirit, that our love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, that, so that this body may be built up to approve what is excellent. Help us here, Lord, with presumptuous sin, with indwelling sin. We ask that you strengthen us, that we may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, and that all of this will be done to your glory and praise. May this be done in the matchless name of Jesus, through the Spirit dwelling in our hearts. Amen.